a, a little reminder of uh, our regular discussion kind of a format. Uh, we usually do uh, four attentions. Uh, the first attention is uh, what. So in namely what the speaker is trying to tell us and uh, what my cognition systems are reconstructing something uh, as closer as to what the speaker wants to give us. So that's what stage. stage. And the next stage it would be in the gut. So what will be my immediate reaction uh, or, or the most of the questions of um, clarification comes from here. So the gut stage is direct uh, response without uh, too much thinking. Now, third stage is, uh, so what? So what <laughs> is a little bit of more expansion on the logic deduction or, or some kind of consequences considering expanding of the system being considered. And last stage is very, very important. Uh, is now what? So, so what, gut, so what, and uh, now what? Now what is the action stage? Is what are we going to do with whatever we learn here? So, so that's just a little reminder for you guys. Uh, I guess Jerome has been taking yeah. notes. So Jerome is trying to say I can say, say Jerome something. and I are trying to do something. So Jerome, why don't you talk about that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course. Well. Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry, I was a few minutes late. I had another meeting that ran over uh, with the, the the person who's coordinating my work, so I couldn't uh, leave. <laughs> so anyway, <clears throat> so sort of my boss, I guess. But um, so I mean, just I, I I didn't prepare anything, but just the comments that I have, and I, I apologize in my correspondence uh, if I was uh, a little bit brash and or rude even uh, in recent weeks I've been just drowning in work and I do thank Bob for being here despite still I think recovering from a COVID uh, infection so and still you know being on the ball and uh, with uh, your memory and, and everything intact so that's excellent to see you in, in such a state. Um, uh, so I mean I, I think I'm the only economist here as far as I know uh, and so just I, I yeah, I just Ego is so ah sorry sorry <laughs> just I just wanted to bring in the the, the economic sort of um, machinery a little bit and and then c come back to rare and the presentation so uh, there's a great book by Philip Murawski uh, more heat than light about the uh, connections between uh, neoclassical economics and, and and physics and basically pointing out the the physics envy that uh, economists have had in their adoption and continued um, maintenance of the model of classical mechanics and fluid dynamics of the 19th century. Uh, and um, so Herman Daly, the name was mentioned uh, to me, is somebody with his framing of ecological economics that still to some extent is victim to this, uh, this uh, framing and even notions like uneconomic growth that he uh, advanced in his work uh, are still using the theory of marginal utility uh, and, and the basic ontology that, that is behind neoclassical economics with a different sort of facade or content. So I found very refreshing uh, this work by uh, Brian uh, Sally and, and others, Dan, who I guess left. Uh, and, and, and it seems to me to be truly an attempt, or I, I wouldn't say not truly as to say that Herman Daly is not trying to move to new, uh, or was not to new um, ontology, but I think that there is more to be said, uh, there's more potential here. And it seems to me that there are a lot of ongoing discussions and I don't think that the last has been said about regenerative economics. So I, I hope that this is the beginning of a discussion rather than just footnotes. So I, I, the, you know, this is a cybernetics group. So I see a lot of reference to ideas from cybernetics and complexity theory. And uh, um, Bob, you mentioned Whitehead. So uh, white, it's a very Whiteheadian perspective, which I embrace focusing on processes and relationships. Um, and so again, feedback effects, I guess neoclassical economics focuses on them only in terms of prices and demand and output and these kinds of things. but. Uh, but really, we're looking at the logic of the uh, economic system itself using using this, uh, this this these concepts. So, even the design and the history of the economy uh, 
looking at it as a living system, I think is, has a lot of potential and uh, even lo looking at things like system or structure mapping rather. And, um, and, and there seems to be more and more literature that's applying these, uh, these, these, um, these methods or this ontology of this framework. And Bob, you mentioned some using, uh, applying it to power grids. And I just read a very interesting paper by um, Philippos, uh, um, um, uh, what's his last name? Uh, Philippos um, Zupolos, yes, looking at an island, an entire, the economy or the system of an entire island. This is uh, Samithraki in Greece, and basically looking at this island as a selection system or an environment and uh, basically tracing it out using ascendancy analysis, ascendancy analysis, and seeing that over time, the island in fact became less efficient, which could be seen as a good thing. And so to me, I, I personally was very much um, influenced by the work of Eleanor Ostrom, uh, the first woman to win the Nobel Prize on, on economics, which doesn't really exist, and studying commons. And so, a lot of the ideas that I have been interested in, and Sally mentioned my interest in things like cooperatives, uh, and I've just come back from a research trip slash regeneration trip to the south of Italy, where there are a lot of these uh, so-called community cooperatives that are really working on exactly applying the theories that we're discussing now. So now what? Uh, it seems to me that the ideas like cross-scale circulation and diversity of sizes, uh, there needs to be a lot less focus, as Sally said, on, you know, large and efficient structures, companies, banks, and more on, again, regenerating communities that are really uh, dying in many cases uh, because of a lack of capital, lack of, again, if we're looking at energy, you know, money is, is a form of energy and economic in the economy. So uh, they they don't have access to capital. There is a vicious cycle. Young people are moving away. The skills are, are leaving. So um, in that sense, um, this idea of cooperatives as having both a, 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 an economic character as well as the cultural or the community uh, character, to me, seems to be a, a perfect representation or manifestation of, of these theories of collective learning as well as regeneration. Um, and so I hope to, to be in, in dialogue with, with all of you on these, on these issues. So I think these are really fascinating topics. So um, I, I guess, yeah, Bob, you mentioned the, the chapter we're writing together in this handbook of cooperative economics and management, where we're really trying to look at how one can apply a process ecology view, or what Bob has developed this notion of process ecology, which is you know very uh, sanguine or similar, or, or I would say the same as this regenerative economics framework, and, and focusing on how to apply measures. And I think one kind of critical comment, uh, afterthought that I would leave everyone with is the uh, and perhaps this has to do with everyone's training, the, the tendency to prefer quantitative measures over qualitative ones. And so the 10th principle of rare is you know, collective learning. We could look at other ones in a similar way as well. It seems to me to be very difficult to measure collective learning quantitatively. So it seems to me that at least some of these measures, uh, if these are to be the ones that, that are, are the, you know, the canonical ones, need you know um, participatory research where field researchers are going basically to where people are uh, where the economic activity is occurring and asking you know what what was the outcome so I, I was again in the south of south of Italy talking basically to people coming uh, from work going to the the the, the uh, to get a beer after work to the to the corner store and asking them, what their experiences had been with this community cooperative. And I found it fascinating how people who really were not interested in it and who are, you know, just a truck driver said, actually, yes, I've heard of the project. I get my water from them or I've had this and this connection with them. I think they're doing a great job. So again, there seems to be this connection between uh, regeneration and uh, again, building a sense of society or community in the, in the white heading sense or community which again, we are, uh, Sally mentioned it in a neoliberal era where people have been atomized and, and split apart. And, and so the question to me of, of now what is how to regenerate a sense of community. So I, 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 I don't know if all of this is very coherent. Uh, I'm pretty tired after all these uh, weeks of, of, of giving lectures. Sorry about that. Well, for what it's worth, I think what you're doing is, is exactly the, hinge point of success for the future um 
figuring out how to have, especially leadership that that serves the health of the whole as opposed to just themselves. Um, Cause that's what, the, I mean, the current, I mean, if we look at this from this really long historical perspective, we keep having these S-curve cycles, right? Um, so if we take the late medieval period, we had the horrible oligarchic corruption and exploitation. And it was, you know, you had the Renaissance, the Reformation, the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, all of which turned that, you know, the medieval oligarchy into a modern, what well, was supposed to be, you know, Adam Smith's free enterprise was supposed to be. And they started out with, a, you know, a real reaction against rent seeking and liberating, you know, commoners from uh, oligarchic control, basically, is what I would have said. But over time, that got turned into a new justification, uh, turned into free markets, which was a new justifications for why you want oligarchic power to be maximized. Um, and I think what we're witnessing now is the collapse of that whole enterprise. And so it's it's not just efficiency in, in economies, it's it's what's best for oligarchs in everything. It's in, I mean, I look at um in the in the US, healthcare is like this abysmal mess because they are maximizing profit for, you know, hospitals and insurance companies and not the health of people. And so a lot of this is going to come down to figuring out how to it's not redistribute wealth. It's it's getting wealth to go to the more effectively in a, in a power law distribution to the people and to the to the real economy services and goods and services that actually produce everything as opposed to what we have now which is this giant wealth sucking vortex that pulls wealth created by the real economy people and turn turns it into this speculative concentration of wealth and power that then creates a positive feedback cycle of increasing wealth and power <laughs> because you have influence over so many systems I know Larry has his hand raised, but I so I was just I, I I had totally forgotten I was going to share one single slide. This is just from a presentation I did a few uh, weeks ago, and it uh, it's 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 very basic. It's 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 not I'm not using any polynomials or anything here. But I mentioned this community cooperative I visited in the south of Italy, and uh, I have to tell a very, very short story. I guess th there was an attempt to build a large solar farm, you know, these big fields of solar panels that are producing gigawatts of electricity outside of this medieval village. Um, and basically some of the citizens organized and decided to create a cooperative that because the village has flat roofs, they put the the, the panels on their own roofs. Uh, and, and so this was the start of this community cooperative that has done many other activities and services since then including purifying water and offering after-school services and uh, regenerating a park and other things I could mention. So just, but that's the, that's the background. And so on the left here, I have, these are just two counterfactual situations. I have what would have happened had they had, had they just um, had the large uh, solar field, you know, with, with, with a large company getting a large loan uh, to build this large field and then get providing electricity to citizens who are paying tax, you know, those taxes and revenues and these kinds of things. And on the right hand, I have what actually happened, where you had, in fact, uh, citizens who organized, and they also, you know, had the, basically on a smaller scale the same thing. They have electricity, they have the taxes and revenues, etc. But then there are all these other flows that are transpiring, including the mutual aid of the citizens and. Um, you have the influence of, I have here Lega Co-op, which is a large cooperative federation in Italy, probably the most powerful in the world. Uh, and uh, so th they created, they helped create a new law that created a new legal form. The community cooperative in Italy was the first of its kind. And um, then they provided a whole other batch of services, including the water purification, as I mentioned, and they have new members. So people are coming into the cooperative. So the point, again, being, as, as Sally was saying, again, you're moving beyond just um, this passive sort of producer-consumer relationship and, and, and really creating um, feedback effects. That, that, sorry, that, that's, I, I had forgotten to, to show that. <laughs> well, actually, uh, what, that, that um, diagram fits very well with the flux density thing. Have you ever heard of Michael Schumann, who wrote, uh, what is it? Um, 
Small Mart and the uh, I'm trying to remember his names. Anyway, he he does uses multiplier effects. So he looks at how much money circulates in the community as opposed to goes up to some distance head headquarters for a, for a large corporation. Um, and what you find is if the money goes more to the local community, it, it then creates all of these more positive benefits for that local community because they're more likely, to, local people are more likely to contract to other local people and they're more likely to pay taxes and more, you know, on and on and on and on. Um, so restoring those kinds of local circuits is really critical to the whole human enterprise I think at this point. Please put the name of the chat. I didn't catch it. Larry. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, continuing on this economics thread, uh, both what Sally uh, presented and, and what Jerome talked about seems to resonate uh, with Kate Walworth and Donut Economics. And I'm curious if you're familiar with that work, and if so, how do you have any comments on on how it might uh, mesh with what you're you're talking about and what you're doing? I'm happy to look at that. I'm absolutely familiar with Kate Raworth's stuff. Um, of course, my whole shtick is trying to get this basic work that's that's out there in all sorts of different fields and bring it together in a more coherent framework that can be easily understood and digested by people working in economics and urban planning and uh, international development and these kinds of things. So we actually have some of those people in other aspects of rare. Um, I guess the difference is that Kate still has environment and ecology at the center of things. So it's still a, oriented towards sustainability in an environmental sense. and I think if we're really going to attack the root problem, we need to get at the cultural aspects. I know Kate's work as well, and I think it's um, it's it's interesting and very useful, and in, in particularly in one sense, in that she begins the book by uh, I don't want to say deconstructing, by uh, analyzing and interpreting the role and the use of images in economics which I think is a, a vastly under-researched uh, discussion or under a discussion that's not had enough. And then then she develops her own images of the donut and these, these kinds of things. So you can say what you will of her own, whatever, her own spiel, but uh, I, I certainly think this focus on the images that we, we use, the metaphors that lie behind those images and the power that they have in channeling and even constraining our thinking in terms of what is economic value and, and where does it come from is, is very important. It also seems uh, to reflect uh, this dialectic that, that Bob was presenting between growth and efficiency and the need for resilience and maintaining resilience. And uh, I, that's, that's another thing I found interesting about it. I characterize the current economy as it's not trickle down, it's suck up. <laughs> yep. Ego, you haven't talked yet. <laughs> First, I, I wanted not to speak because I'm, I was so much too late. I'm really sorry for that. Uh, that I said, no, I'll just record, uh, I'll just look at the recorded video to the start developing from the start. I would mention a few words, uh, uh, maybe maybe related to Jerome's uh, passion, and that is that basically you know each organization needs the basically capacity to act as an agency. So it needs it needs some some competences. And for instance, a healthy local community has that. And they they can, first of all, oppose and put resilience to the attempts for their environments to be managed by large corporations. And, you know, and it may be interesting to see from the perspective of 
uh, what local communities, which capacities do they have and which are still lacking to actually act as an agency. And it would be important for, from the governance uh, perspective, I mean, if you can see which uh, capacities are lacking, you can work on those to make them work as an agency in their environment. And sometimes this is hard. Your own, you mentioned the lack of capacity to reach for the finances, right? This was just one of them. One of them is the lack of young people picking up the knowledge because we are always uh, talking about uh, organizational knowledge or collective knowledge generation, but we are always forgetting about the collective forgetting thing. And we know that, you know, some things which worked are now just forgotten. Sometimes it takes uh, half of generations to forget things. Sometimes it takes three generations. But eventually, if nobody carries on picking up the knowledge, it will disappear. And that, that might be interesting to see from the perspective of the entropy. I don't know, but I, I'm really sorry. I was not from the beginning, so it's hard for me to to see uh, what I have missed and maybe repeating it. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, more questions? No, but a short comment uh, on Igor's very astute uh, summary or question or, or reflections on Bob's notion of agency and Sally's notion of uh, a horrible syntactical uh, statement, but a beautiful cultural statement. And that is the atomization of the individual citizen uh, in the community. And this atomization of individual citizens within the community results in their loss of agency at a higher level. And the democratic principles necessary to recreate that agency at the local level are missing. And Bob's, you know, Lanovitz's view gives a very clear uh, presentation of why this maximization principle uh, is uh, a disaster for the atomization of individuals and for the local culture. And so to reestablish local culture, the notion of cultural agency at the local level supported by the local population using local energy resources in the example given in the cooperative, uh, really uh, capture a very significant part of the nature of economic thinking and regenerative thinking. So put a lot of ideas together there in a very strange way. I hope I haven't confused everybody, but uh, I hope at least some understanding uh, emerged from it. The uh, uh, maybe maybe uh, my uh, I have a suggestion. Maybe we need to do a, a follow up session on this, focused on that uh, local community build up stuff. I think Jerome, you probably can give us the detailed story of your South uh, Italy experimentation or what you call it, and. Uh, I also have one small case in the village I live that I can report it as a case study uh, from a, telling you the story from the beginning to end, how we cooperatively, the neighborhood cooperatively uh, build up our road, things like that. Uh, if you are interested to do the next session, uh, Jerome, what are you going to say? Yes, yeah, sure. I mean, well, now, I mean, I was going to respond to something else, but I mean, I can also respond to that. Yes, surely. That sounds wonderful. In fact, um, I put an article here in the chat that I wrote uh, that was published in March in um, This View of Life, which is a publication that was uh, started recently by David Sloan Wilson, evolutionary biologist, and his group of pro-social and we're actually, the second link I just put in there, we will have a discussion on these topics, uh, I guess in, in 10 days. Um, so that's that's a link to that 
it's an online chat, so you can register for that. I will talk about this as well, but I can talk about it again. I'll probably be talking about it for, for years to come. And to Igor's comment, um, I think the question of local capacities is not so always so easy. And the ability for citizens to self-organize is not always given. So in the south of Italy, in Puglia, where, uh, where I did this research and where these projects emerged in recent years, they have a very specific culture and environment. And this is the southeast of Italy, not the southwest, where you have the mafia and these kinds of uh, organizations. So there's a Robert Putnam did you know a lot of his work there, uh, the social the issue of social capital. So there is a lot of community cohesion that has really main, been maintained over centuries, and it is true that it, it is at, at risk of collapse. So I think uh, Jason, you've talked a lot about uh, facilitators, facilitation. By the way, pro-social that's what they do. They're facilitators, and I think that in many cases we need uh, facilitators around the world as a kind of a public good. Uh, who can come in and help communities to overcome some of their natural, I'm well, a, I don't want to say I'm natural, but they, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, yeah, this kind of thing. Yeah, that's um, <laughs> Douglas, that? Douglas, Hof, Douglas Hofstetter had his memoir, I'm a Strange Loop, so somebody should write the book, I'm a Public Good. Uh, but um, okay. just one example of that was in Sri Lanka. I mentioned Eleanor Ostrom, who did decades and decades of research on commons and and the management of common resources. And I th think one of the most interesting examples in her book, Governing the Commons, is uh, irrigation canals in Sri Lanka. And Sri Lanka, as many of you know, is a multi-ethnic island. You have the Senegalese, you have the Tamil, there was a civil war, as you know. And so um, they visited an area basically on, on the border between two, you know, the, the Senegalese and the, and the Tamil communities. And the irrigation systems there, the ditches had basically come into disrepair because both communities thought, well, if we repair it, then the other, excuse the language, assholes will, will, will benefit as well. So it took an outside team from, I guess, the University of Indiana uh, to come in and basically say, we will help you. We will talk to you. What, what can we do? How can we help you? And so on to then actually reactivate the community to, to, to rebuild these ditches that then, of course, benefited everyone. So, so in, in this sense, agency sometimes uh, is not is not is not all, is not present from from the, from the beginning, and it has it takes an, a sort of a push from outside. Sometimes that's what I was going to say. Bob, uh, I just wanted to add a, a little remark that when we think of agent and agency, we think of sentient beings or at least biological beings. But the whole concept of agency goes back even beyond life itself to autocatalytic reactions, the idea that, that an autocatalytic reaction with memory can literally discriminate, choose among contingent effects that are raining down upon it, choose those that are to its own benefit and avoid those that are not. So that agency, I maintain, agency has been around, and this is a something I took from, from Jason, Eric Jason, that it's been around since the Big Bang virtually. Uh, it's not just something that came with life. Thank you. Are you all aware of that Fuji's uh, uh, Cochran's book, Turning Point? The Turning Point, I think, uh, and then later they made a movie. The movie's name is called Mind Walk. Uh, what the discussion today reminds me of that movie, the, which we translated that movie into Chinese. Uh, so if you haven't seen it, uh, I highly recommend. But uh, from there, that was, I think, 20 or uh, 30 or 40 years ago. And what, what is exactly happening after that, after that transition of men? mental model. Uh, I think we do have a lot to reflect on. Uh, I like what J Jerome said, I am a public good, but immediately that evoke a question, uh, how can I not to be a public nonsense? Uh, because currently, if you observe, if you observe what's going on in the world and uh, uh, you have people 
going into the museums, destroying art, saying that it's a saving planet. Uh, you have people glue their hands on, on the road, blocking the traffic. And so that sort of a thing, are, are, are those sort of things also public good or public nonsense? Uh, I, I guess we need to discuss that. What do you say? <laughs> I mean, I have a very strong opinion there. And I think that to me, these actions are in most cases, uh, most clearly a sign of somebody who has, or groups who uh, have the sense, whether that's true or not is, is, is up for debate, of desperation. So, I mean, I, I'm a, a sort of a product of the American civil rights movement in the sense that, you know, my father and his generation were the first in Alabama, my dad's from Alabama, uh, African-American. And uh, they they were the first generation to go to integrated schools, and they didn't like it. I mean, of course, they didn't like it because they were spat at and they were bullied and and physically uh, molested. And uh, and and so, I mean, that was the result also of decades of uh, civil disobedience and people doing things that just weren't so nice. They sat at lunch counters, and you know, in fact, they were doing things that were illegal because. There was a law that said, you know, blacks should go to a different lunch counter or maybe you don't have a lunch counter, eat your lunch outside or there are different hotels and so on. The buses, the Freedom Riders, etc. So there was a time in the U.S. I know they did uh, public surveys that over two thirds of Americans thought that what the Freedom Riders were doing was bad. Um, of course, you know, history has a has a way of of, of clean cleansing. And now everyone says Martin Luther King is so wonderful. But, you know, of course, he at the time was was uh, was was not uh, supported uh, in, in the mainstream media. Now, of course, Obama put his statue in the White House and so on. So I think that um, civil disobedience and breaking the rules is something that you see historically again and again and again, where people feel that they, they don't have, again, this constrained sense of agency, uh, and and that's that's what's again to them is left. That's how I see this. What what these people are doing, um, yeah. So, Peter, we haven't heard from you yet. Um, yeah, I have listened with uh, <laughs> a lot of fun, and um, thanks for the great presentations. I I do not have a. Oh yeah, maybe I have a question, uh, Bob, to you. You mentioned um, Gregory Bateson earlier in relation yes. to ecosystems and information. And then uh, I also a little bit direct myself then to Sally because isn't there a debate in ecology between Odom, who is completely focused on energy, and Bateson, who's very much focused on information. Right. And what I hear from Sally is more or less sort of an integration. Is there any response? Is there any well, that, it resonate, Sally? Maybe absolutely. I actually one of Howard Odom is one of the reasons I got into all of this. Ah, look at that. <laughs> yes, ah. and and Jane Jacobs actually, I've got the two of them together. So I. All right, so that link is indeed there. I was curious. Yeah, and um, I have here a basic book. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, and. That he does. Bateson, I think, is just more of a general theorist. I mean, I think what for me I got out of Odom was that you could actually connect this to empirically measurable kinds of things without destroying the, the topic under study. I mean, that's what happened with in psychology is that in order to make it measurable, they had to basically do horrible stuff to the actual system under study. So if you're looking at how, how do you measure motherhood, you know, you'd have to make up these awful kinds of guesswork kinds of um, what I, I mean, what I find useful out of systems theory and com combining it with energy is that you, you explain, you can understand sort of naturally why there are these universal patterns, morphodynamics is what they used to call them for, for me when I was in nonlinear dynamics. Um, and that you, those patterns are, it's like Plato's, uh, attractor is like Plato's ideal forms on the wall, in the shadow on the wall, in the cave wall. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, you know, they're individually unique and they're diverse. And yet they're also reliably occurring in all these different systems. 
So you could use those because they they must have some reason why they're there, why they're so so universal, why they exist in so many different systems. So I, I mean, for me, that's where system science and energy systems kind of link up is in the ability to explain why those kinds of universal patterns exist and why they're useful in measuring things like systemic health in human systems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Bob, you. Yeah, please. If I may comment on the debate between uh, uh, Bateson and Odom, uh, I didn't realize that they had ever come together and, and talked. No, they about didn't. That. It was more. Okay. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, there's H. T. Odom, Howard T. Odom, and there's his brother, Eugene P. Odom. They were very different in their outlook. Okay. Uh, uh, Howard Odom thought energy was everything, and, and you know, energy is pleroma and so forth. Uh, uh, Gene, however, Howard was very mechanical. As a matter of fact, I even heard him one time say, you know, if you if you look finely enough, you'll see that everything is mechanical, you know, which is something I didn't agree with. But I, you know, I learned a lot from Howard Odom. Don't don't get me wrong, but I mm -hmm. didn't agree with him on that point. Uh, but what Gene said is that ecology is 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 calling us forward to think in very different ways. In other words, uh, Gene didn't didn't just acquiesce in the material world, uh, as, uh, uh, as as Dan Fiscus uh, mentioned and so forth. He, he, mm. he said he felt that that ecology uh, would show us new pathways into a different sort of metaphysical vision. And uh, I'm very much a, 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 a disciple of that, to be honest. Oh, Unfortunately, yeah. Unfortunately, both have passed away. All three have passed yeah. away. I, I recognize what you're saying in Eugene's book, indeed. Yes. And I, if, if I try to say it from my smaller perspective that what Bateson was doing was referring to the old Odom and Bateson's way, and then he's a bit more like Gene. He doesn't reject energy. He's, I, I think he didn't say it literally, but I think he he felt information more as an emergent property of the dynamic of the ecosystem and need, in need, of course, of the underlying energy. And I feel that maybe Gene, as you mentioned, made a little step in that direction. Is that yeah. correct intuition? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, okay. I call my entire approach process ecology because yeah. you know, yeah. there's, there's that, that, formatted uh, on process, not on objects. And, yeah. uh, and I think that was the direction that Gene was going. I owe a lot to the man. I had breakfast with him one time at the University oh, wow. of Georgia, and I'd given a talk on, uh, 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 oh, this is terrible. I, I'm, I'm having my, my 80 year old phase yet coming um, on, on causality, Newtonian causalities. And, uh, you know, I, I discussed the, 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 the five Newtonian causalities and why there's a problem. Gene got me down at breakfast and pulled out this piece of paper and drew a line down the center. And he says, okay, Bob, you mentioned what? You have atomism and uh, 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 chance and, and uh, anyway, the various Newtonian causalities. Now, what's on this side? This is ecology. What goes there? Well, I really wasn't able to give him a particular answer, but, but it stuck with me. And it finally resulted essentially in my third book, which is available in Chinese, incidentally. Mm -hmm. um, my, my third book, uh, uh, that uh, uh, it, it's an attempt at a different at a different underlying metaphysics. It doesn't reject anything that's gone before. It's supplemental. And you know, I I agree with 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 Sally that that there's a lot of help in, in, in energy. And truth of the matter is, uh, as as Jerome said, we find it really difficult to quantify uh, various social attitudes and and values and so forth in, in, in a quantitative way. Uh, and, and, and I find myself resorting to, to carbon and, and energy uh, to create my networks and whatnot. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I, I do this all in the spirit of Gene Odom, that, that ecology is showing us the way forward, that we, it's a lens beyond physics. Uh, and without, without denigrating physics and so forth, but it's limited, it really is. Okay, thanks. I will both with Sally and with you reread re Eugene's book again with a lot of pleasure, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, folks. Thank Ryan? you. Peter. 
Yeah, I, I was just going to jump in there. I actually had the pleasure of having an office like two doors down from Gene as a graduate student at Georgia because I was using Bernie's office and he was in the row of stars. And it was like Frank Golly and then Bernie where I sat and then a um, uh, few other people, Pomeroy and then Odom at the corner. He had the corner office, of course. But anyways, um, but I think what you said, Bob, about um, Bates and absorbing some of those ideas about ecology, you know, his final book or one of his, you know, Ecology of Mind. And so he was coming kind of full circle with that. So that's um, a nice integration of those. I, I guess I want to come back to um, a couple things, maybe if we still have time. One about um, with Kate Rayworth's work and, and Sally had mentioned earlier about, um, but I mean, I think it is a nice integration of the social piece into, into, um, into the Ruckstrom planetary boundaries, which which we could also go into. But anyways, where I've been thinking a lot, it's not it's not about the redistribution of what we have. And I think Sally said it well, it's more about getting the system to get the things to the right places in the first place. That's different than redistribution. But even more so, I would go to the next level is, again, referring back to the overshoot that I think we are currently in, we just generate too much surplus. And nobody's focusing on surplus. We're only focusing on redistributing the surplus that we have. And how do we scale back in a way that doesn't generate so much surplus? And that could be a local community-based thing because communities have real constraints as far as land and, and ecosystem services and bio, biodiversity, bioproductiveness. And, and so, so solving, pro I don't like solving problems. I don't think we solve problems. Dealing with the, managing the world um, at a local level might, might just resolve some of the right i mean um the best way to solve a problem is to make it obsolete somebody said that right so um so yeah i i would i would focus more on the surplus generation in the first place rather than what you do with it afterwards it's one comment Jerome? there is a, a some literature in financial or monetary i guess rather economics a passanetti i think is one on um, basically macro the macroeconomics of profit and there's a good book it was actually i think the doctoral dissertation of andrea carrera who's now a professor i think in madrid and uh, it's called the a macroeconomic theory of profit and he summarizes a lot of this and uh basically shows that um you know at a high enough scale there is no profit profits are a fluctuation uh, based on um, the uh, business cycle, or not the business cycle, rather, but uh, varying rates and motions, so to speak, between sectors of the economy and between businesses. Um, but I'm not sure I agree with you, Brian, that the focus on what is to be done with the surplus is secondary. So again, I've done a lot of research in Italy with the cooperative movement there, which is the strongest in the world, and they have big profits sometimes, of course, during um, uh, economic downturns, of course, they also are in a, in a catabolic state. And, um, but uh, I find it very interesting, the culture of retained profits that these cooperatives have developed over the centuries. So many of these cooperatives have retained upwards of 90 or more percent of their profits instead of distributing them to their members. So, I mean, even the, the, the culture of profit and dividends in cooperatives is such that you, you very fairly distribute it. But again, a lot of them are not even doing that. They are instead reserving the, the, the profits for bad times, for developing the movement, for investing in projects like this one that I, that I showed in, in Medipignano, which would not be probably viable if it weren't for these very strong cooperative banks and uh, financing institutions. They even have a development fund, which is a half a billion euros, which is, I think, the largest cooperative development fund. And it wouldn't exist if it didn't have profits and a surplus. So I think, um, I mean, you can shoot for a steady state economy and these kinds of things, uh, especially in the developed world. But I don't, I, I, I think I disagree. I think that what you do with profits is very important. And they, they will occur. They will occur through the fluctuations that exist, the imperfections in information, and the fact that again, uh, capital is not entirely um, uh, it's not entirely mobile. So you you can't entirely dispense with investments that are already ongoing. So there will be there will be divergences in profits. So I think, yeah, that's my reference. yeah. I'm curious about the references that you that you mentioned. So that that sounds great, and I, I would. 
Um, one of some of my thinking, uh, I found a book recently that's actually from like the 1950s by Fred, Fred Cottrell on energy and society. And he talks a lot about surplus in there. And when I, I think immediately you think of surplus as profits from a financial or monetary sense, I think of surplus as a biophysical sense of, of the, the kind of a great, like, yeah, just more, more stuff. And, and I think that Cottrell was also coming from biophysical, even though he's a sociologist. Um, but the point being, I would just add on top of that is in, in that book, he mentions that ancient societies or older societies kind of so feared surplus that they would they would hold these rituals, like the, the end of the year ritual to burn the surplus. Let's have a big party and have a bash. Did for you fun. believe? Did you believe? Yeah, exactly. And so they, they recognize the danger of having surplus and concentration of surplus and that. And so they would they would just burn it. Right. It, essentially, it's like, well, that's that's a different perspective than we have today, I think. Gary? Yeah, uh, uh, to go back to the notion of agency and its relationship to the philosophy of economics uh, as presented uh, by various forces here in relationship to the ecology. Uh, today, we've heard three different notions of this, uh, in, in a, this that overlap in many ways but the question of agency is very ill-defined in these uh, comparisons. And so uh, I'm reminded of the last session that we had at Club of Rain and the discussions of, of, uh, of Lou Kaufman and uh, his discussion of the relationship between the uh, Wittgenstein's notion of language and the laws of form notion of language. And how does that possibly relate here to the semantics being employed? And it, it seems to me, uh, particularly Bob uh, Ilanovitz, as usage of agency, uh, has a particular view of mathematics involved with it. And so I, the general question is a philosophical question of what is the material basis of agency? Or is material causality the wrong way to look at agency? Uh, this question of how we interpret the term agency uh, goes in many different directions. Uh, it, if you would, the, the walk of the semantics of agency covers many grounds, many territories, many concepts. And I'm really confused about how this term is used. I have, I have a very strong predilection to my own definition of agency is the ability to discriminate. Okay, very, very different from, uh, 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 you know, radical. Yeah, you know, when, 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 uh, and an agency, when an, it's a process really uh, of 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 positive feedback that that uh, associated with memory, such that when a contingency occurs that is beneficial to the autocatalysis, it is incorporated. Uh, and if not, it's just this goes on. And this ability to discriminate, to filter and whatnot, I think is at the heart of agency, even before there's uh, sentience or, or, or biology. Uh, so I'm very narrow in that, in that regard. I tend to be narrow with regard to mechanism too, but that's, that's part of my predilection. Other comments? I, I appreciate yours, Bob. <laughs> Other comments about its usage? I, I think a point. I think you're pointing to uh, a difficulty that's related to what Sally was saying when she talks about the cultural importance of of this whole thing. In other words, what we value, how we think. I, I remember a quote from Bateson. I don't. I don't have it exactly, but it was something to the effect that major problems of the world. Uh, 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 can can be looked at as a result of the difference between how how humans think and how the world works, uh, or how nature works, I guess it was. And this how we think differently relates to our language. And whether it's language of agency or hierarchy or or uh, uh, belief even, even the word belief, uh, it, you know, makes a difference. And it makes a difference, difference on how we go forward. Uh, um, for me, there's something very different when I use the word agency to talk about what I do as a self-conscious, aware person making a choice from these other kinds of uses of it. 
It's very different. And, and unless we so separate those, it's okay to use it differently, but it's, unless we separate these differences somehow, we just end up in a muddle. And so that, that's my comment, Joe. Iran? Uh, hmm. I mean, I mean, there are differences maybe, but maybe it depends on the scale. Uh, I'm not sure I, it isn't possible to reconcile these different notions. Bob's, for instance, so I'm, I'm thinking, Stuart Kaufman, you know, we were discussing his book. He talks about the, oh, I forget which verb, but something like the management of variety. So the question of, uh, of agency for, for, for Stuart, I think was all, always, and he gets it from Mattarella and others, uh, maintaining, I don't want to use, I'm just using very, very vulgar words here, the supremacy over uh, so something that is that has that requires more variety uh, than its environment. I guess is, is how I how I gather Stuart uh, defines it. So in that sense, I think that that's similar to what what Bob was saying with with um, discrimination. And for me personally, in the social realm, so maybe this goes back to what Larry was saying. Uh, you, you, there there seems to be a way to interpret that. And, and for me, the best representation of agency that I found in, in academic research, at least, was is this paper by uh, Padgett and Ansel that some of you might be aware of uh, on the rise of uh, the Medici in Florence. And they use the word robust action. And they find, you know, they study based on marriage, marriage records and financial records of credit and debt, debt, debt and so on. Um, how Cosimo de' Medici managed to amass uh, enough uh, authority, uh, relations, whatever it happens to be, proximity to to the right families in Florence, you know, to 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 have this putsch, this coup d'état that he had in whatever fourteen thirty four, whatever it was, and um, and and so it seems that he that relationships were going through Cosimo, and it was the centralization of relationships through Cosimo that allowed him to, again, amass his power. So that seems to me to be a representation, at least, of he, he was discriminating, he had agency, others did not. So and I'm not sure if thinking in language are sufficient for agency. I'm thinking about slavery, for instance. Do slaves have agency? I don't know. Again, this notion of robust action would suggest no, because you are de facto a tool of someone else. If you disobey, you're, you're shot, you're killed somehow or the other. I don't know, it's just discussion. I don't know how to put my hand up. So if somebody would tell me how to do it, I'll put my hand up and be a good participant here. But I have a couple of reactions to things that have been, have been said. Um, go, to, go to the three dots at the bottom, press that, you'll find uh, three that dots you can at, manipulate the hands up. I, what, bottom of what? Or maybe it says reactions on yours on the bottom of the screen where it says reactions. Oh, reactions. Ah, there it is. Okay. Let's see you do it. Go ahead. Yay! <laughs> Golly, go ahead. <laughs> um, so I, I'm, part of me is, you know, I got mentored by a physicist. And so I, I have all these reactions to, you know, putting physics in this little box in, in cl of classical terms. Um, but so agency for me starts out is basically the concept of concentration and creating the capacity to do work. And that takes different forms as, as you go up the evolutionary ladder. So that by the time you get to human or living systems, agency is hooked up with intelligence, which is this responding functionally to information. And that gets you by so far. And then by the you have collective intelligence built into the entire system getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so by the time you get to human systems, you have the, this huge capacity to do work, which is built resulting from the ability to make concentration and do capacity to do work in, in an economy and a society as a whole. Um, but then we we use our cultural systems, which again is basically the intelligence side of agency to um, create something that didn't exist before. And which in theory, what we, we try to do is economic outputs, outcomes 
influence societal beliefs and cultures such that if you're if, if things aren't working well in theory as a learning society we would change those but what's happened is in essence we've got these oligarchic systems that take over and block learning block effective learning essentially so they don't try to solve the problems they try to get hide the problems basically <laughs> so that's my two cents and thanks for telling me about the reactions <laughs> I have been looking at our welcoming screen. It says we the OTA. Perhaps we need to change that actioner into agent agent. If you do you think that will make sense? Agent? <laughs> Bob, Bob, no, it's not in. <laughs> so so actioner probably uh Jerome mentioned a slave. Okay. The slave slave doing labors uh, qualify as an actioner, but it may not be an a agent. So probably an agent is better. You you guys think so? So we put that, we can change that A into agent. Agent. Right vote, yes. We can talk about systems. <laughs> That's uh, you know, okay. let, let, let's try not to find differences. Let's see if we can uh, synthesize a little bit. If we're talking about systems, they actually, they are there because they interact in their environment better than the environment, right? Their mm -hmm. activities are somewhat better. And when Sally came to oligarch, you can do that two ways. First is basically, uh, you know, optimize your internal processes but they are better than the environment or you can decrease the the quality of the environment and you're again better right so this is this is sometimes the the system deliberately decrease the quality of their environment to sustain to be still there, to be still needed. So we are talking about, you know, the dynamics are the interactions with the environment. These are the things that agency does. And then there is the internal structure and the internal processes of the system. And I'm talking about systems because it's a general term. Anything in there. And then these internal processes basically are being optimized and as, as uh, Bob so nicely said, not too much and not too little. They just need to be in the sweet spot in order to, for the system to sustain. So if we can agree on something like that, but I think that is relatively, it, it's fundamental, but I think it's general enough. So before we close, when when do you think you want to do a next session, uh, especially Jerome talking about your case? If I could, so if I could interrupt Jerome before you start, because it, I want to bring to closure some concept with regard to the notion of agency, as I understood the speakers or the responses to them, all of which I thought were excellent responses. Uh, and it had a, a nice rationalization of the concept of agency as it is used in different disciplinary languages. And the original uh, content of my question had to do with Bob Milanovic's notion of agency as purely a mathematical thing. And that the language of mathematics is sufficient to describe agency. And I, uh, see Sally's uh, commentary on the other side of things, purely a thermodynamic view of agency, uh, which uh, expresses uh, the organization of agency in terms of work of the system and the work of the system being uh, determined by the discipline from which the language originates. And uh, the final, so I thought it was excellent clarification of the concept of agency. The final point that I probably didn't make clear, I was referring to Lou Kaufman, 
not Stuart Kaufman. <laughs> Boris? May I add something? Uh, I don't know, but maybe when Igor was talking about system and maybe Jerome when was talking about the variety, uh, maybe he thought about the requisite variety from Ashby. Now, this is uh, some kind of yes. law which is saying that uh, the amount of disturbances that try to displace the system from the stability has to be in accordance or to the variety of the compensation, compensative uh, mechanisms that uh, system has. So if system will compensate all disturbances that are coming from environment, then it will survive. If not, then it will not survive. In any interaction with environment or with people, uh, living, I'm talking about a living system, maybe a non-living system uh, will be better described by Bob. <laughs> but living system will survive if they, if they have enough compensating mechanisms to uh, compensate disturbances, that the, the variety of disturbances that are coming from environment. That, that is the basics of Ashby's uh, requisite variety. Yes, you're right. I, I, I mentioned Mattarella. I meant, meant Ashby. Sorry. It's, uh, yeah. Good point, Boris. Uh, Jerome, do, do you mean Maturana or Mozzarella? <laughs> I'm just tired. I'm just tired. <laughs> <laughs>